And a couple of you asked for the handouts. John's bringing them to you. And I know you'll be happy about this. I was working on this message the last couple of weeks. And uh, Saturday morning, well, actually Friday night, I'm putting it all together and getting ready. And I said, I'll leave this part because my handout, which was almost eight pages long, is just the front and back of one piece of paper instead of 16. And uh, my 47 slides are down to about eight. So I, I'm trying to cut it down. Uh, because I, I wax too eloquent sometimes. <laughs> okay. But today, uh, I want to do something. And uh, we did the announcement a second ago. And uh, there's some uh, August celebrations. And one of those is my wife and I and, and Sam are going to California for almost two weeks. So we'll be gone. Uh, and the other rest of you all have birthdays and stuff like that. You notice Louis Reuter is up there. That's because on his birthday is the 8th. And on the 9th, he gets here. And Amanda, my daughter, and her husband, Louis, so you guys know, uh, they're getting transferred in the Army back here to Florida. They'll be out of Fort Myers. And so they'll be back here working in the church and being here and all that kind of stuff. So that's, that's really nice. Okay? So today, my message is this. Let's just brag about God a little bit. Okay? Where do you start? Like I said, I had about 16 pages. <laughs> and I said, I can't go through all of this. So we'll, we'll, we'll cut it down. But feel free to add in if you'd like. I just want to brag on Jesus a little bit and uh, see how it is. Okay? So let's brag on Jesus. First of all, he's gracious and merciful. Now that could be two points, but I made it one to make it shorter. Okay? In Psalm 116, verse 5, it says, Gracious is the Lord, and righteous, it throws in the third one, I didn't. Yea, our God is merciful. Now, each of these things has its own definition. But let's keep it simple. Grace, God riches at Christ's expense. Think of it that way. A little acronym for you. What God gave to us had to be paid for. We couldn't pay it. So Christ paid it. So we get God's riches at Christ's expense. We can be saved. We can be on our way to heaven. We can spend eternity with God in heaven, not because we deserve it or bought it. He just gave it to us. That's grace, giving us something we don't deserve. And he's righteous. We'll leave that one for later. Our God is merciful. What's mercy? Not giving us what we do deserve. So he's gracious. He gives us what we don't deserve, and he withholds from us what we do deserve. Now that's in the good context, okay? We deserve punishment. He holds that in mercy. We deserve nothing. He gives us heaven. So God is gracious and merciful. And I had about five or six dozen verses on that. But we're just going to do one more. Second Chronicles verse thir chapter 30, verse 9. Look what it says here. There's an if, and that's why I have this one here. If ye turn again to the Lord, your brethren and your children shall find what happens if you'll do right. If you'll turn to the Lord, then you will find what? Compassion. Later on, we have a point here, God is love. We'll talk about that in a second. But If you'll do right and seek me, God says, I will give you compassion. Now, look at this. It's important to understand. Is God's love unconditional in one aspect yes he will give it to anyone and he offers it to everyone who actually gets it the condition to god's love are the people who will take it is god's love given unconditionally yes how was it applied it's, a, it's applied with a condition you have to want it if you don't want it he will not force it on you so the reception of, the benefit of, the blessing of God's love is conditional upon whether you want it or not. But it's unconditional offered to you. If you will turn to God, you, your brethren, your children, you'll find compassion before them that led them captive. What will, will the result be? So that they shall come hither again, back to this land. Okay? If you'll do right, God will have compassion on you and he'll restore to you what you had before. For the Lord your God is gracious, gives you what you don't deserve, and merciful, withholds what you do deserve. 
He will not turn away his face from you if you do right. If you ever find yourself in a position, in a place, in a circumstance, in a situation that's not really going great and you wish it would be like it used to be, turn back to God. I'll guarantee you this. When you find yourself behind the eight ball of life, you ain't there on accident. You got yourself there. Mm -hmm. Illustration from the scripture. The prodigal son woke up one day in the pig pen. He said, how did I get here? No, he knew exactly how he got there. Mm -hmm. And he knew what the solution was. If I'll get out of this pig pen and go back to my father, he will, he'll forgive me. But he's not going to come here and condone what I'm doing. The father never goes to the pig pen. But when the boy is stepping out of the pig pen, the father sees him far off and runs and hugs him. Mm -hmm. So point one, God is gracious and merciful. Two, God is perfect. Now we use the word perfect in two different contexts. So I'm going to explain them both. And this one is the first one. God is perfect. Absolutely nothing amiss. Nothing wrong. Totally, completely right. The word perfect is also seen in the Bible, in the English translations, and it actually means to be complete and mature. It doesn't mean you're perfect without fault. It just means you're trying to do it the right way. The Bible says have a perfect mind. It means think right. It doesn't mean you always will, but you should. Okay, so there's two contexts of that. So let's stay on the first one, the one that we all normally understand. God is perfect. Look what it says in 2 Samuel chapter 22, verse 31. As for God, his way is perfect. His way, the way God thinks, the way God acts, the way he talks, the things he does, nothing ever wrong with it. Nothing ever at fault with it. God is completely, 100% correct, right, all of the time. Think of this. God will never say, oh, I could have had a V8. He never does that. Has it ever occurred to you that nothing ever occurs to God? He knows it. And he always does it right. If you knew everything about everything, about everything that you ever thought, said, or did, and how it would end up being in the end, you'd do exactly what God wanted to do. Because he does know everything and how it's going to work out. That's why he says, don't do that. Do this over here. If you do this, it'll work out. Don't, don't do that. It'll... And we do that over there that he tells us not to. And we, well, why am I in the pig pen? You chose. So in the Bible, we see several different times. I'll just use one. Moses is talking to the Hebrew people just before he, he passes away. And he says, I've shown you death and curse. I've shown you blessing and life. Choose life. There they are. There's no third option. Joshua says to the people of Israel, choose who you're going to serve, God or not. Well, I, I want to, there's no third choice. There's no neutral. Okay? God's perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. That word tried there is referring to is purified. It's in the fire. It has been, it has been smelted. It's been cleansed. The impurities are out of it. He's a buckler. And the reason he's the buckler is what we would say is the, the, the chest plate on a suit of armor. I was watching a show the other day on, on uh, Nova or something. They, they, were put, they were trying to make a suit of armor and only use the technology of back then. It was really interesting. One of the problems with the suits of armor back then, they did, oh, really great. And, you know, a kid would shoot a pea shooter at it and it would crack. Because metal has to be tempered just right so it actually has enough give not to break and hard enough not to let... And the, the suits of armor were really great and until somebody came out with a gun and the bullet went through it. But, but it would stop arrows and stuff. But the thing is, what it's saying here is the word of God, what God says, has been purified. It's been tempered. It's been through the fire. It's been molded. It's perfect. It's pure. The impurities are out. He's a buckler. He protects us. All of them that trust him. You trust him. He's a buckler. He'll guard you. Okay? God is perfect talk about that one for a while but we won't but listen anytime if you want to throw in something you raise your hand I'll call on you point number three God is holy God is holy this is similar overlaps with the perfect because it deals with purity 
In the Bible, there's a verse that says, Be thou holy, for I am holy. Okay? And we talk about living a holy life and that kind of stuff. And understand, you, me, us, we. We cannot be holy. Can't be done on our own. Can't be. Let's change the word holy to the word holy. Spell it different. We can be wholly dedicated, completely dedicated to God, and through us, God will live through us the holy life. That's what the Bible is talking about when it talks about being spirit-led, living by the Spirit. Okay? Being holy unto the Lord. Because when he sees us, everything is going through us by his power. Well, let's see what the Bible says in, the, in the Psalm 99, verse 9. Exalt the Lord our God and worship him in his holy hill. Why? For the Lord God is holy. Okay? He's perfect. Nothing about him that's off. But the ingredients. So I taught science, so I'll, I'll speak science kind of in a way. Okay? His molecular structure is correct, as it were. Now please get this. That's, that's an earthly example. God... He exists in a dimension that is different. But there's nothing about God that isn't perfect. His chemical makeup, as it were. His DNA, as it were. The reason he is perfect and he's a buckler is because every molecule in it is holy. You and I aren't that way. The only, you, the only way you and I can live a holy life is to let him live through us. And anytime we find ourselves living on our own, through ourselves, of our own might, of our own strength, of our own thinking, we ain't holy. No matter how good you think you're being. Now look at me. Can we be, humanly speaking, can we act good? Yeah, I can be a nice guy. And if you want to do some entomology on the word nice, look it up. They come from two Greek words that means I don't discern. I don't know the difference between two things. Therefore, I'm nice because I'm non-discerning. So next time you want to be nice, what it means is I treat everybody nice because I can't figure out who's good or who's bad. I don't know what's right or wrong, so I'm just nice. That's what it means. Well, can't you just be nice? No, there, this is good and this is bad. I'm going to cleave to the good. I'm going to get rid of the bad. Oh you, oh, you bigoted person. No, I'm not going to stick my hand in the fire. It will hurt me. When it comes to sticking your hands in things, fire ain't the one you want to do. But the non-discerning guy picks up the hot lead, picks up the cold ice, and says, I don't know the difference. Okay. Don't do that. God is holy. His chemical, as it were, speaking in a human context, his chemical, his DNA makeup is completely pure. There's nothing about him. Talk about this I've mentioned before. Uh, God is love. Why is God love? Because he loves, 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 loves. He's everything. He just loves everything. He pets dogs and kisses babies and he waves at the neighbors and he's just full of love. He, he may do that, but that's being or acting, but he doesn't act with love. He is love. If you could, you yourself, if you could live the rest of your life, we're starting today with a complete brand new slate. Nothing in the past counts, right? And from now on to the day you die, you never told another lie. You'd be a very honest, truthful person, right? God isn't truth because he never tells a lie. God is truth because he can't tell a lie. You understand? God, he is love. He is truth. He's not just the map. He is the way. He's not just showing us the way. He is the way. Every, every molecule, every strain of DNA, as it were, in his being is holy. Okay? Man, I could go on. I can't. Okay. Here's one to remember. Let's, let's brag on God. He's in control. He's the boss. How many of you have ever worked for someone? Right here. You've worked for somebody. How many have ever worked for more than one person? How many have ever worked for a really nice guy? 
How many ever worked for a jerk? Okay. Be thankful. Let's brag on God for a while. He's the best boss you could ever have. He'll never test you past your ability to do it. He'll give you everything you need to get it done. He'll give you time and be patient with you to get it done. And he'll love you all the time through it. And he'll even walk up and say, you want some help? I'll do that for you. And then give you the credit for having it done. Long time ago, I read this, and I forget what the president, who the president was at the time. But in the office, in the, in the Oval Office, they had a little thing, a little plaque. It's not. It was theirs. It's not in the Oval Office all the time. But it said, it said "You'd be surprised." Something like this. You'd be surprised how much can get accomplished when you don't care who gets the credit. Listen. Stop worrying about whether you're going to get the trophy. And get the job done. When you don't care who's going to get the credit, you just do it. And God says, you want to go to heaven? I'll do that for you. You want to serve me? I'll help you. Oh, you need, you need one of those widgets? Here, I'll give you mine. And he's in control. Now, we, we sometimes use a little plaudit. Now, I've read the back of the book and we win. That's great. That's one and it's true. But we read the back of the book and we win. Sometimes does not really help me right now. Okay? Sometimes, yeah, I look back at the, when I was in high school, and we won the football game, but I also twisted my ankle. And at the time I was laying on the field holding my ankle, I wasn't thinking about we're going to win the game. It hurt. And after the game was done, we won. I went home, my ankle hurt. Okay, but now think of this on a spiritual aspect. God is in control. Every aspect of my existence, he controls. He controls. How many kids I had? Nine. They were all from God. The job I had, because of God. The money I made or didn't make, because of God. The health I had, good or bad, because of God. The position I'm in now, collectively, my whole, because of God. He is in control. Now, I'm not fatalistic and I'm not a predeterminist. That's not what I mean. I have free will. God says, do that and it'll be good. I'm not even going to tell you, Dave, what the good's going to be, but it'll be good. There are times I've chosen to do that. And he said, it'll be bad. I'm not going to tell you what it's going to be, but it's going to be bad. Do this, it'll be good. And I've done the bad, and I end up, oh, thunder, tarnation, what the... Oh. God says, come back. If you will seek me, I will return you. Hey, I'm patient, I'm merciful, I'm kind, I'm gracious. I love you. You want the good? Go over here. God's in control. Now, whether I let him control me or not is my decision. But even if I decide to let him not control me, he's still in control. You understand? I coached wrestling for many years, had a great time, loved it. But uh, there were guys on the mat, on my, on my squad, they'd go out there and they'd get themselves in a position the other fellow would do something, and me and everybody on the team would be going, hug a button roll, hug a button roll. That was one of our moves, hug a button roll. Okay, we're just shouting and screaming, and the guy won't do it, and he gets pinned. Everybody knew what to do. You don't listen to me. You're going to get pinned. Who was still the coach of the team? Me. Who set up the schedule? Me. Who decided if you were going to wrestle the next match or not? Me. Whether you listen to me or not doesn't mean I'm not in control. But the reason you got pinned was your fault. You understand? You get the analogy? Hopefully you do. Let's move on. Number next. God is security. Now look at me again. 
He doesn't just offer us a secure place. He is the secure place. He is security. Trust in him, Psalm 62, verse 8 says. Trust in him all the time. You people, put out of your heart, pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge. He is our refuge. Now think about that. He doesn't just have a safe place to put us. He is the safe place. Hide in him. One of my favorite songs, and I've argued with people about this before, and they can be wrong if they want to. The best hymn that was ever written is Rock of Ages. That's my opinion. I like Rock of Ages. It's my favorite song. Okay? I, I love it. Rock of Ages. What's the next line? Cleft, broken for me. Let me hide myself in thee. That's a great song. Man, that's a great song. Biblically true. Now, you might like the Hallelujah Chorus and all that, but Hallelujah Chorus is a good song. And it's as good as Rock of Ages. Because Rock of Ages is personal. Woo! Broken for me. Nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to your cross I cling. Naked, here before thy face, Humbly I cry out for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly. Mm. Wash me, Savior. Oh, Lord. In Him is security. Deuteronomy 33. Deuteronomy 33, 27. The eternal God is thy refuge. So how long can you find refuge? Eternally. Forever. You'll never stop. The security we find in God never ends. Man alive. Let's brag on God a while. Okay, we get down to it. God is love. You thought I was going to have John 3.16, but I don't. I have 1 John 4.8 and 9. He that loveth not knoweth not God. Look at me. This is, this is one people will argue with me. Every time I read this and say this comment, I, I'll have somebody argue with me. And you can. You can be wrong. If you don't know God, read it. 1 John 4, 8, if you don't know God, you don't know love. Can you think you know love? Can you sing about love? Love is all we need. Love, love, love. Love is like oxygen. Yeah, I know all the songs. I'm a bad pastor. Okay? But all those are cheap facsimiles of what an emotion you think is and you call it love. That's not what love is. Read the Bible and find out what love is. God said, you hate me, you despise me, you want nothing to do with me. Here, let me die for you. I want the best for you. It costs more than you can pay. I'll die for you. Even though you hate me. If you don't know God, you don't know what love is. You might know what emotions are. But come on, let's face it. I love my wife. I also love spaghetti. I used to have a dog. I loved my dog. I loved wrestling. But somehow they were different. And my feeling for them was different. God says, I'm love. I don't just love, I am love. In this, verse 9 says, in this was manifest the love of God toward us. This is what love really is. He sent his only son to die for us so that we could live. Okay. God is love. Man. 
That's remarkable. God is impartial. I'm really happy about this one. God is impartial. Now look at me. Everybody look at me. Don't look at your notes. Don't look at the wall up there. Look at me. How many of you will be honest enough? Don't raise your hand or anything. We don't want to embarrass anybody or yourself. How many of you would say, if I was really going to be honest and I, and I had to write it down, my list of bad is, is longer than my list of good? You know, if you, if you do enough good stuff, it'll outweigh your bad stuff and you'll be okay. Uh, no. First, your good stuff ain't ever going to outweigh the bad stuff. Second, how much does good weigh? How much does bad weigh? Is it numerical or is it ounces? Is it metric? How does that work? I don't know, but I'm based on going to heaven and I'm going to do more good than bad. That's a pretty sad argument. What's the Bible say? God's impartial. Let's look what he says here. Acts chapter 10, verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and he said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. God doesn't care who you are compared to anybody else. It doesn't matter who you are compared to anybody else. God looks at you by yourself. So he's impartial. Look at Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. The way you dish it out is the way you're going to get it back. God's impartial. I look at you, not you compared to anybody, and the way you do it is how you're going to get it. And he said to some on the right, enter into the joy of the Lord. And he said to the ones on the left, you're cursed. Why? Because of how you did things, the way you acted, the way you thought, what your values were, how you accepted or rejected me. You don't want me? You on the left? Then go where the people who don't want to be with me, it's the only place you can go. Those who wanted me, enter in. You get it the way you want. God's impartial. Now let's be honest, okay? I'll use some humor here. I'll, I'll warn you. Okay, this is humorous. Okay, it's supposed to be anyway. You sit out there and you look up at me and say, if I could just, I know I'd get to heaven, I could just be as nice as Pastor Dave. I could just be as wonderful as he was. Because, you know, after all, he's, he's, my, he's my idol. But I am my ideal. Uh, <laughs> I'm joking. It's all it said. You're not right with God based on how you compare to me. And that's good for you. It's good for me. What did Jesus say? A master called his servants in, and to one he gave ten talents, to one he gave two talents, to one he gave one talent. You mean they all got different amounts? Yep. To whom much is given, much is required. If you're a two-talent Christian, be thankful. You know, there's something really nice to be able to say, I punched out and went home. But when you're in charge of more, you're accountable for more. If you're a one-talent Christian, fine. Use the one talent as best you can. Make it two. If you're a two-talent Christian, do the best you can. Make it four. Well, I've got more than anybody because I'm a ten-talent Christian, so I can just kind of lay back and... No, 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 no. You're judged not compared with anybody else. It's what you did with what he gave you. Okay? God is impartial. God is able. It has three subpoints to it. Okay? So this is my long one here. God is able. First of all, he's able to save anybody. Anyone can be saved. Second one you'll see there in the middle, God can securely establish anybody. You don't just get saved and thrown back out in the water. He can save anybody, and he can securely establish anybody. And third thing, he can supply everything to everybody, however what it is they need. He, can, he makes sure you have it. God is able. I couldn't reduce this one down, so you get all of it. Romans chapter 11, verse 22 and 23. Behold, therefore, the goodness and the severity of God on them which fell. Talking about the angels specifically. Notice God kicked them out of heaven. But also understand, therefore, the goodness and severity of God toward you. Goodness. 
If thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou shalt also be cut off. He's also speaking there uh, in the application of, in the book of Romans, God has transferred his attention, not his sole purpose, but for the time being, his attention from the Jew to the Gentile world. God's not done with the Jews. Okay, don't, don't get that all messed up. But to the church in Rome, he says, hey, those, those that fell, and he's speaking specifically about the fallen angels and so forth, but he's, there were people who were part of God's family aren't doing right, but he's good to you if you continue doing what he says. Don't be like the prodigal son out in the, out in the pig pen half your life. Don't do that. And they also, if they abide still not in, by not still in unbelief, even they, not the fallen angels now, so you see he's talking about the, the, the other Christians, if they will do right, they'll be grafted back in. Now, it's not talking about losing your salvation and getting it back. It's talking about your fellowship, your position, the fellowship with God. Notice the severity of God and the goodness. If you stick with God's plan, you're there all the time. But if you drop out of God's plan, you're over in the pig pen. But if you get out of the pig pen, he'll graft you back in. So there's levels of application there. Is God able to save anybody? Yep. And that they're grafted back in goes right back into our tails into uh, the second part, uh, Romans chapter 14, verse 4. Who are you that judges another man's servants? To his own master he stands and falls. Yea, and he shall be holding up, for God is able to make him stand. Look at me. This is exceedingly important for all of us to get in our hearts. You ain't the judge of another Christian. Well, they just don't do it the way I would. So what? Unless you can go to your Bible and say right here in this passage, it says, do not do this. Then let them do it. It's between them and God. You get that? How many of you are old enough to remember all of the pulpit-pounding rules? I grew up with it. And there was good stuff about the rules. The rules weren't evil. But we tended to put the rules ahead of everything. And if I can just dress it up and make it all look good, my heart will be right. And the complete opposite is true. Get your heart right, and the outside will get cleaned up. Some of you don't remember, so I'll, I'll just have fun with you for a second. Parting your hair in the middle was wrong. Wearing wire rim glasses was wrong. Bell-bottom pants were wrong. Platform shoes were wrong. Uh, any kind of popular music, it didn't matter what it was, was wrong. Uh, going to the movies is wrong. Bowling was wrong. Playing pool was wrong. Uh, I, I'm not just... Facial hair was wrong. Uh, no good Christian would do that. Jesus had a beard. Well, that was a different time. Oh, sin is balanced on what day you live. Well, if you don't wear a coat and tie when you go to church, but in the Philippines they wear these little shirt things. Well, sin is, sin is geographical. Please bear with me here. If in our church... We had, everybody who comes up to the platform, our policy was you had to wear a robe. And if you're up here to, on the platform, should you wear a robe? Yeah, it's our policy. Nothing wrong with that. But the day I get up here preaching in my robe and say, if you don't have a robe on the pulpit, you're in sin. We've crossed a line. Okay? Got to understand, policy and sin are not always the same thing. <laughs> okay? So, God is able to graft you back in. If you've fallen away, he can graft you back in. And look what it says here in Romans 14, 4. You're not supposed to judge the other guy. If God tells you, don't do that, and it's not in the Bible, he's telling you. I don't go to professional sporting events. I have a personal conviction about that. I don't think it's wrong for them to exist. I don't think it's wrong for you to go. I think I would have to answer to God if I went. Well, why is that? 
I don't know. The Holy Spirit just told me not to go. So I don't. Okay? I have in my lifetime been to a movie theater. I might go again. I don't go and see films that, des that denigrate scriptural things. Okay? But if, you know, if Disney's Robin Hood was at the theater, I'd, go, I'd love to see... I would love to see Sound of Music on the screen again. I, the first time I saw it, I was like fourth grade or whatever. But Sound of Music was great. It's not that great of a movie, but I, it was cool. Battle of the Bulge on the big screen is really neat. It really is. But what did we do? Going to the movies is wrong. But I can watch it on TV. I can rent it on video. I can own the DVD. So you don't have a problem with movies. You have a problem with that building. Think it through. Okay, I know people, you want to argue with me right now. But God says, don't judge your other brother. He stands before God. Look at the third thing. Not only can he save anybody and restore them if they've sinned and establish you, because he's taken, he's taken the account. Number C, letter C, God can supply everything you need. He can do it for everybody. 2 Corinthians 9, 8. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you so that... You, always having all sufficiency in all things, can abound in every good work. Everything you can do, God wants you to do, you can do, because he'll give you what you need to get it done. End of story. Can he save me? Yes. Can he restore me? Yes. Is he the guy that's keeping score? Yes. Can he give me, will he give me everything I need? Yes. Hallelujah. Because listen, the day you start depending on your job or the government or your boss or your husband or your wife or whatever to give you all that stuff, you're going to live in misery. Get ready to be disappointed. Because people, come on, look at me. People are disappointing. The best we can do is sometimes think about you, but usually even then I'm thinking about me. Let's be honest. The closest you ever get to being selfless still has a little bit of self in it. I'll do anything you want, but I won't do that. God says, here, here's my son. Man, God is able to do anything. Okay? God is faithful. We talk about faith and saving faith and faith, 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 a lot of things like that, okay? But God is faithful. And the word faith, faithful, faithfulness, it all comes from the word or the conjugation of the word pistos, pistos, pistas, so forth. Um, and it means to be committed to. Now, there's a more to it, but to condense the definition, it means to be committed to something, to rely on something, to be 100% into it. God is faithful. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. There hath no temptation, no test you've ever been in, no trial you've ever gone through, that you're all alone. Other people have suffered this too. Other people have experienced this too. Other people have to deal with this. It's not unique to you. No one's ever suffered like me. Yes, they have. Look at me. I'm going to talk to this audience of people right here. Okay? How many of you don't have a running water and a flushing toilet in your house? How many of you don't have at least one, if not five or six, shopping center stores within three miles drive of your house? How many of you have air conditioning in southwest Florida? But you just don't understand. Weaker people have gone through a whole lot worse than you will ever experience. How many of you survived DACA? Anybody? Oh, no, nobody? How many of you lived through the Great Depression? Maybe one or two of you. Dick did. Dick's old enough. Anybody here lived through the Depression without a father and the youngest of 13 kids? Not my dad did. 
I'll never understand or, or be, come to appreciate the fact I'm the youngest of 13 kids and I've got no dad. And it's the depression. How will I ever? I'll never be able to appreciate it because I didn't experience it. But God says, I'll send my son to live as a human and I myself and my son are the same person. I will experience everything you go through. I will know it intimately. No test will ever come to you that I don't know exactly what you're going through. I didn't just read it in a book. I went and I lived it. And I am committed to you. God, I am faithful. I will never let you be tempted. Look at the verse. I'll never let you be tempted beyond the point that I have established in you to be able to bear it. I've given you everything you need. And I'm right there with you. The temptation, the trial, the struggle you're going through does not have to break you unless you reject me. In your darkest hour, in your worst fear, in your hardest time, just hand it to me. I'm right there. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. He's faithful. He's committed. And nothing you ever do will change that. You can't change his faithfulness. Man alive. He's aware. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. Listen. God does not forget what you're doing. When you're living for him and trying to do right, and he knows what struggles you're going through, and he knows what trials you're having, and what circumstances you are, he knows that. He's not unfaithful. He's not unrighteous. He's not a dimwit. He doesn't forget. He knows exactly Everything you've ever had to do, ever had to go through. And he, man, man, Fred was good today. Keep it up, Fred. Not, not there yet, but man. At the beam on, Fred, enter into the joy. You struggled hard. You fought hard. The Apostle Paul, what did he say? I've kept the faith. I've finished the course. I've fought the fight. What else did Paul say? I'm the chiefest of sinners. I look around, I can't see anybody worse than me. But I've kept the faith. Fought the fight. Finished the course. Enter in. God sees our heart. He's aware. God is unrestricted. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. Remember that Jesus Christ, the seed of David, was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even into bonds. I'm, Paul said, I, I'm on my way to jail. But the word of God is not bound. God is unrestricted. Be thankful for that. Praise him for that. Nothing this world can ever do will restrict him, bind him, limit him. The only thing that can limit God is for you to say, I don't want your love. He won't force it on you. The only thing that limits you from God's love is your decision. Now get this. Everything else is totally at his discretion. Except whether or not you'll accept his love. But he's unlimited. The word of God is not bound. Jesus Christ is the word of God. He's not bound. He's not fettered. He's not limited. He can go anywhere and get anything done. He can supply any need. And if I will, if you will, individually as a believer, yield to the will of God in your life and follow the leading of the Spirit, he will live in and through you to his glory and you will receive a reward. It's like you did it. Because he's aware of what you're going through. And he came and lived as a human. And he knows what it's like. In the Garden of Gethsemane, the human side of him said, Father, is there anything else we can do? Just like you and I would have done. 
listen, if you knew crucifixion was on, on your table to, to happen next, would you say, hey, Dad, is there anything else? we can, Is there any other way? The human side of us wants, yeah, come on. But the spirit side of them said, but whatever you want, not what I want. Ergo, Jesus is our supreme example of what it's like to live a spirit-filled, spirit-led human existence. No matter what I want, what I really want is what God wants. He's unrestricted. He's aware. He's merciful. He's gracious. He loves me. So we see there, he's gracious, merciful, perfect. He's in control. He's love. He's able. He's aware, holy, secure, impartial, faithful, and unrestricted. There were about 45 more of these. We'll do some other day. Let's brag on God a while. Okay? Let's pray. Dear Lord God, we thank you for your love for us. Help us to serve you. Help us, Lord, to understand and appreciate to whatever degree we can everything you've done for us and, and realize that we don't deserve any of it. Help us, Lord, to love you back because you first loved us. For it's the name of Christ I pray. Amen. All right, Dave, if you'll put on some music, and uh, John and Floyd are going to pass their offering plates, you give what God has laid on your heart to give. And I'll tell you, we need all the money you can give because we got bills to pay. So do what you can. Ask God what he wants you to do. All right? And music is playing.